so you mentioned how uh, the progress that Black Lives Matter has made over the last five years. Um, I was hoping you can expand on that a little bit. What specifically did they do in, in your mind that, that has made the movement so successful? And what can uh, people in the immigrant rights uh, communities uh, take away from that? Well, I, I mean, the immigrant rights communities are so, they've been working so hard and for so long. Um, and, you know, I, I think the main challenge for the immigrant rights communities is really invisibility. Um, you know, people don't understand all of the different laws. They don't understand all of the different visa categories. It's easy to kind of fall into um, simplistic narratives and even very, very knowledgeable writers and I'll, I'll include myself in this, we, we kind of fall back into these narratives to be able to convey storylines that are easy to digest. Um, so I think advocates and activists, I, I, you know, for example, the DACA storyline was so easy to sell to a lot of people, but even the main narrative that was, that was ultimately carried through wasn't necessarily true. There are so many aspects of the DACA recipient experience that is different, that's nuanced, depending on where you came from, how you got here. You know, there's a story, this narrative, this is the only country they've ever known. That's not true for many DACA recipients, um, nor should it be. So I think there's this question about nationality and citizenship and, and what does it mean to, you know, belong that should be somehow decoupled from access and rights. Um, you know, people should not be denied like the basic rights and access because of an accident of birth. And I think that should be just kind of accepted across the board. Um, but I think what's really been powerful about the Black Lives Matter movement is, you know, at the same time, you know, that I think I've heard several activists say that like we can walk and chew gum at the same time. So at the same time that they've really been very clear and focused about police brutality, say her name, defund, all the way to abolish, which, you know, we should be very clear that those are two completely different positions, defund police and abolish police. Um, and those are kind of in conversation with each other. And it looks like people are listening, but, you know, aren't necessarily in full agreement. And I don't think we as a society have to pick a side if we don't know. You know, we can just listen and learn and, and ultimately hope that, you know, in the end, the, the move will be, um, will be less about getting rid of something and more about uh, giving back to. Uh, I think one of the positions that I've heard a lot about, and I think this is also true of immigration issues, is we can't talk about defund without talking about reinvest. Um, somebody once said, uh, there's somebody who's worked, uh, I, I'm blanking on the name, but a, a very high, uh, like a high profile person who's spoken a lot about police reform and, and criminal justice uh, work. And, uh, you know, what, what he said was that ultimately, you know, the only real investment that we've seen over many decades in black communities across the country has been in police and in um, punitive systems. So if you take that funding away, then there has to be an equal co commitment to investing in these communities. And I think the same needs to be said for immigration reform. Mm -hmm.